Welcome to this edition of RF Breakthrough. I'm excited to host this important and timely discussion today with our colleagues from the Coalition for Inclusive Capitalism and the Ford Foundation. For decades, business practices and economic policies adopted and supported by both political parties have favored capital over labor, the wealthy over working American families. The people most important to the success of our market economy and our country, workers and their families, have fallen behind as companies focused on delivering profits to shareholders while government took a hands-off approach. As a result, our productivity has increased on the backs of workers while their salaries for decades have stayed stagnant. The American economy has become hollow with too many workers seeing declining opportunity and too many families losing hope for their children's future. That's why over the last year, we brought together a diverse group, bipartisan in nature, of academics, business leaders, investment leaders, public policy leaders, philanthropists, because we knew we had to focus on the needs of the American worker and the American worker having his or her fair share of the gains in our economy. The result was the framework for inclusive capitalism, a new compact among business, government, and the American worker. It is vital that this be a compact, that business and labor come together with the best ideas. Frankly, we didn't always agree on everything. For some, policies went too far. For others, they didn't go far enough. But by prioritizing the need of the American worker and focusing like a laser on what government could do to rebalance the gains in our economy, we were able to come up with these 21 policy ideas. When we started on this journey, we were not in a global pandemic. We had not experienced the racial reckoning to come and the economic fallout. But what we know today is that we need a new kind of capitalism, one that values both capital and labor, one that recognizes that the promise of capitalism is shared prosperity. That is our aim, to provide an economy that works for more people so that mobility and opportunity are realized. What makes up an economy? Well, lots of things. But for a long time, perhaps the most critical part of the US economy has been overshadowed. That's America's workers. Look at it this way. Over the past 40 years, workers have become 70% more productive at their jobs. In that time, the S&P 500 grew seven times in value and CEO pay went up 940%. But then there's the worker. In the last 40 years, hourly wages for the average worker rose by only 12%, while costs for healthcare, education, housing, and food have all gone up, and benefits for many are out of reach. The American worker on average is providing more value while earning less. There's an obvious disconnect here, one that's made much worse by systemic racism, gender bias, and rising inequality. Not to mention the pandemic, which has intensified and exposed these problems. This is the crisis of the worker, one faced by too many Americans. If we want to rebuild an economy that's truly strong, we need to change the way working Americans are valued and treated. That's why we developed the framework for inclusive capitalism. Created by a diverse group, the plan brings together business and workers, government and private sector, Democrats and Republicans. Together, we've outlined 21 recommendations along three tracks. Create better jobs, expand the workforce, enable fair gain sharing, 
To create better jobs, we need to make sure all workers are valued. We need to get rid of policies and practices that discriminate and make sure people can stay safe and healthy on the job. We can expand the workforce by investing in infrastructure, build up low-wage workers with training, and break down barriers that keep them from getting better jobs. And to enable fair gain sharing, we need to bring workers into the fold. Corporations should give them a stronger voice and engage workers on issues such as pay, benefits, and working conditions. This is just the beginning. Solving the crisis of the worker will re-energize our economy and put prosperity back in the hands of those that create it. It will make America more competitive and give all people a chance for a better, more equitable future. The framework is the guide, but we need bold action to make it a reality. Welcome to the launch of the framework for inclusive capitalism. My name is Rana Faruhar. I'm an associate editor and columnist at the Financial Times, and I'm so pleased to be here to help launch this framework, be a part of this event, and in particular, start off the day with this panel about fair gain sharing for workers and how to bring worker voice into a more sustainable capitalism. Um, we've got about 25 minutes for discussion. We're going to take some audience questions. So I'm going to launch right in and introduce our panel. We have a fantastic panel of folks representing the investment community, the corporate world, the public sector. Um, we have Ursula Burns with us today, who's the former Xerox corporate chair and CEO, and also former chair and CEO of Vion Limited. Uh, she's also a Taneo senior advisor. We have Lynn Forrester de Rothschild, who you've already heard from, Inclusive Capital uh, Partners Managing Partner, and, and also um, really the leader and, and founder of the Coalition for Inclusive Capitalism. Roger Ferguson is here too. He is a PhD and TI. A.A. Kreft CEO, and the Honorable Leo E. Strine, former Chancellor and Chief Justice of Delaware. Um, really pleased to be here with all of you. I've had terrific conversations over the years with all of you about this topic, and so we're going to try and do our best in about 20, 25 minutes to really hone in and bring, uh, bring it all together and connect the dots. Um, I want to look at the investor perspective, the corporate perspective, and the public perspective on how to have more uh, fair gain sharing for workers. So let me start with the investment perspective. So much of the, the challenge, but also the opportunity here is driven by Wall Street. And something that always strikes me, and Lynn and Roger, I want to get your, your thoughts on this, is that there are great models out there for businesses that are doing the right thing by workers that are investing, that are, are uh, you know, really having a more inclusive uh, vision. They often tend to be private, they tend to be family owned, they tend to be away from the pressures of the market. So how can the framework that you all have developed with the rest of the, the team here, how can it help bridge that gap between the companies that really are showing, hey, you can do the right thing and be successful, and those that are um, you know, more open to that, that short term pressure from the markets? Lynn, why don't, why don't you start and then I'll go to Roger. Thank you. Thank you, Rana. Thank you for doing this. Thank you to my fellow commissioners who are here, as well as to all of those who worked over the last 18 months to create this framework. And thank you for that, that question, Rana. I, I think that, that there is good evidence about the correlation between companies that treat their employees well, that listen to their employees, and their stock performance as well as their cost of capital metrics, as well as the esteem with which they are held in by their customers. So I, I think that we uh, are living in a world where investors are more attuned to the requirements of ESG. And I wanna give a shout out to Justice Strine in the uh, framework he encouraged us to think in terms of EESG, employees, environmental, social, and governance, and that investors need to measure all of those. Uh, and it's critical because investors can't expect companies to raise their head above the parapet and take care of their employees if their stockholders are going to sh slam them. And I think when I began this 
this thinking about inclusive capitalism many years ago and American Airlines increased its uh, pay to its workers a year ahead of what had been negotiated in its labor contract. And the, the, the headline in the Wall Street Journal was American pays its workers more, Wall Street goes nuts. Um, we cannot improve the situation in this country or globally for workers if we don't have buy-in from investors. So the investment returns should be better and ESG should include, like we did, a focus like a laser on the worker. Hmm. Roger, let me bring you into this. You know, I, I, I had a conversation once with the late Jack Bogle, who thought a lot about these topics, um, that, talking about how investors can really help move the dial. And he said, you know, we are the invisible hand, right? We are, we are that, that force that can move things. How do you think about this? And, you know, having had this conversation for so long, are we finally at a turning point? And, and if so, what signs would you, would you point to on that? Well, thanks, Rana, for, for the question, and thank you for uh, hosting this panel as well. Um, and so from the standpoint of the investor, there are three or four points I'd make. Uh, first, um, uh, and look at the history of my own company. Back in 1971, my predecessor, Bill, Bill Greeno, wrote an op-ed that the company cannot be a good investment for its shareholders unless it is also uh, very mindful of its broader societal responsibilities. I'm paraphrasing, but that was you know, a statement that investors want to see companies that behave correctly, and uh, that is a, a central part of the thesis. So are we moving forward? Um, to some degree, yes, but not fully. Uh, and so let me tell you where I think we are moving forward. One is there's a recognition that you know, good ESG performance is consistent with good shareholder performance. For example, there's a McKinsey study uh, that showed that companies that are in the top quartile for ethnic uh, diversity and cultural diversity outperform those uh, in the bottom quartile, uh, according to McKinsey estimate, by 36%. Um, uh, we see other examples that show total shareholder return for companies that have very diverse boards is higher than for those that don't. And so one of the ways I think we're moving forward is a recognition uh, that good shareholder performance is uh, not hampered by, but is rather uh, aided by and consistent with, you know, a number of these other very important uh, metrics of, of inclusiveness. Uh, the final point I'd make is uh, the investor group, um, my company, TIAA, the company that I'm proud to lead for another just couple of months before I retire, uh, has a long-term stake uh, and the health of capitalism. Uh, so the investor group, the investor class, recognizing that you know we depend very much on a capitalist system that is robust, uh, that is supported by society, that is perceived to be fair. And then finally, and I'll close with this, there are examples uh, in history of, of uh, capitalists who also understand the broader uh, focus of capitalism, so to speak. So uh, TIA was founded 102 years ago by Andrew Carnegie, certainly a capitalist, but a man who recognized uh, that providing safe and secure retirements, particularly for folks in the higher ed sector, was critical. Um, and so, you know, once again, we see there are examples uh, in, in the past and I hope in the present of a strong consistency between the investor class and a desire to have a more inclusive and therefore more sustainable capitalism in which we all have a stake. Okay, thank you for that. Ursula, I want to come to you because as a CEO, you've been on the other side of the street. You've been on the other side of this pressure. You've been trying to come up with a strategy over many decades for the companies that you've led that allows them to both compete in a global marketplace, um, but but be sustainable at home. And, you know, I mean, I'm hearing, Lynn and, and Roger have just articulated, there is a broader sense in the investment community that, yeah, we need a focus on EESG. Um, we need more labor share. We, we need incomes to rise. How, how does that work on the ground? Um, what, what are the challenges to that if you're in the corner office as a CEO and you're saying, okay, yes, I know I'm living in a 70% consumer spending economy. Incomes need to rise. There needs to be the political stability that comes from that. But I also have to compete in a global marketplace. Talk to us a little bit about the challenges and how can the framework help with that? Well, let, let me start with the how can the framework help, and then I'll go to the challenges. Um, a, a level playing field, a level playing field is an amazing 
um, wind at the back of a CEO. And one of the reasons why I was so interested in being engaged in, in this effort is because I think a level playing field will help us all. What do I mean by a level playing field? If we all, all businesses, have to abide by the moral and the capitalist um, backbone or, or foundation of fairness, of employer strength, employee strength, of commercial strength, of a successful capitalist endeavor, then we would not be faced with making these one-off choices, these short-term choices of um, increasing our earnings on the backs of our employees, increasing our earnings on the backs of sustainability efforts, et cetera. So having this, having a, a framework that we can get a lot of people, government, the workers, obviously the, the companies, investors to buy into um, would be, would level the playing field and make it easier for business leaders to do the right thing. That aside, even if the play framework weren't, weren't here, CEOs generally understand how important the worker is to their enterprise and their enterprise's success. And when I ran Xerox and when I ran Vion, we had to make choices all the time about whether we invest here or there. And we've tried, we tried, and we still will try, and future CEO I'm sure is trying, to balance that in such a way that we can share the wealth a bit more. So give more to the worker, give a, a little bit more to the shareholder, give more to the government or the communities that we're doing business in. It's very difficult to do. It's not impossible to do, um, and but it's but it's difficult to do. And if we can level the playing field and have a, a clear set of rules that we operate by, I think that we can actually get this done a lot quicker than if, as Lynn said in the opening, we have to be one or two CEOs raising their head above the parapet and getting it shot off. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Um, Leo, let me bring you in to talk a little bit about um, how to push the agenda forward, both from a public sector standpoint and, and a private sector standpoint. One of the things I've been really struck by, um, just looking back in business history. So, um, you know, in the early 1980s, the Business Roundtable shifted to a formal shareholder cap, pro shareholder capitalism stance. They recently, in the last couple of years, flipped and said, no, we want stakeholder capitalism. So that's a big shift. We're seeing, you know, framework for inclusive capitalism. We've been having these conversations and now and now here to launch these principles. That's a big shift. It seems like there there is a real private sector push. We also have a new administration that is explicitly saying we want to protect work, not wealth. We want to really kind of profoundly shift the direction of American capitalism. Um, how how will those two things be balanced? I mean, what needs to, how can they play hand in hand? What what needs to happen from a government perspective, um, and and how can the private sector kind of align with that? No, I mean it's 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 we're talking about almost forty years of American history, but it was actually in nineteen ninety seven when the Business Roundtable really embraced shareholder um, primacy. It earlier it, it actually had a more stakeholder oriented. Um, approach, but when the really the views of Milton Friedman and Ronald Reagan came into place, and all the emphasis in the United States on, on addressing globalization was to make companies more responsive to the stock market, the power of workers went down, and the power of institutional investors went up. The power, the the utility of the framework we have in the current dynamic, is that it's recalling on responsibility from all segments, Ron, and I think it is true as. Uh, my distinguished colleagues talked about that companies can make money by doing things the, the right way. We will also see many companies make money by doing the, things the wrong way. And the share of capitalist gains that have gone to American workers has gone way down. And I want to pivot off of Ursula's point about a level playing field. It's hard for companies to do the right thing if all companies don't have to do minimally decent things. And I think what our framework does is to try to set a level playing field. We argue that People should, in good faith, work towards moving towards a living wage. That would set floors under all workers and would create a more level playing field for companies. And the Biden administration has embraced that, and we hope the business community will come to the table and come up with a solution. We think 
that workers have had a, a right since the 1930s to freely join a union and that that right has been eroded to some extent. And again, there should be good faith cooperation to try to restore that. But then we're looking for, you know, we think that this is one of the promising things about institutional investors and companies coming to the table to recognize that they need to support these policies. They need to support a level playing field. And within corporate governance, we embrace practical solutions like turning the compensation committee of companies into a workforce committee and having them focus on issues within the company of pay fairness. That would support external public policies. That would also be a trustworthy uh, forum for more worker voice at non-union companies. So we, we're trying to come together with something where everybody has a shared responsibility. And for example, on EESG, we're, require, we're looking for not just companies to disclose how they take it into account, but institutional investors. Because it's very difficult, as, as Ursula said, if investors are pushing different policies, they're the ones who ultimately have the vote. So we're trying to align these policies, and we think they fit very well with where the Biden administration is going. And they also require public-private cooperation. I'll finish with this. For example, things like infrastructure investment to tackle climate change and to create jobs, that's got to be a public-private partnership, but that will create huge private sector opportunities. And mm. what's going to be expected of the private sector is that the workers um, of the United States benefit it from that as much as the stockholders. And we return to the kind of fair gain sharing that characterized our economy when we felt best about it. And frankly, that kind of gain sharing will powerfully improve racial equality because black people at the time when we started to reverse fair gain sharing, were just getting, you know, really up and running in terms of having a fair opportunity to participate and they will benefit tremendously if we do this. Okay, I have about 5,000 more questions, but I have eight minutes. So I'm, gonna, I'm actually gonna ask a couple of questions that have come in from the audience. Um, and we're gonna be talking about this stuff for, for years to come. But um, there's a question from Sarah Gonzalez uh, on opportunity for women, which kind of connects to, to a couple of things folks have already said. What can ensure that women, particularly bra uh, black and brown women have equal opportunity to thrive in a system which has also been used to exploit many of them. Um, and I would add to that question, I mean, this is such a timely topic we have um, amidst COVID. You know, we've had many um, women, particularly minority women on the front lines as health workers. We have a real issue with professional women and women of, you know, of all job types falling out of the labor force because of the pandemic. Um, what can we do at this moment to really kind of put their needs front and center? Ursula, do you want to start with that? And then if anybody else wants to comment, just raise your hand. Yeah, I will. I think one of the things is transparency and measurements. I mean, obviously women, obviously it's not a good statement, but obviously women and people of color have, have fallen to the bottom of the reward list across just about any, any effort. One of the things I found out is if we can be, if it could be clear, if we can measure, be transparent about where we start and where we are and how we are progressing. This is in not only in companies, so I am really um, in, excited about increased um, reporting, increased transparency of pay, of positioning of all the workers in companies. If we can be clear about seeing that, then we can actually see where the problems are and, and react positively uh, to them. Keeping an eye on it, being transparent, and being public about where we fall um, will be, I think, will move things along uh, in a very good way. Okay. Any, Lynn, go ahead and then Roger. I agree with that completely. And what I would add is I think it's time that we consider making diversity a metric in employee. Uh, in, in, sorry, in CEO compensation. The conference board did a study of the Russell 5000 and only 71 companies in 2019 linked uh, diversity metrics to CEO comp. And in 2020, it was up to 604. So it's still too few, but I think that uh, in addition to the transparency and in addition to reporting, I think a link to executive comp for, for racial and gender diversity is uh, something to be desired, and I hope that boards will consider it. 
Okay. R I would Roger. agree with that. The only other thing I agree with what I've heard thus far, I would also add that uh, there should be what I describe as a race to the top in terms of companies sharing best practices for the benefits uh, that they might offer. For example, uh, my own company, TIA, our company, uh, this year we've offered access to enhanced backup uh, care um, program for all of our employees, uh, for those that are in our national contact center, for example. Uh, we've said, you know, let us know which eight hours a day you wish to work and we'll create flexibility around your schedule. Um, we've also uh, offered uh, tutoring and test prep as a, as a benefit for some of our employees and, and access to discounted full-time childcare. Um, and so I think, you know, we should also be modeling and learning from each other. What are the benefits that we can offer that clearly uh, support everyone uh, and particularly with the focus on uh, women and disadvantaged minorities who may be uh, struggling a little bit with some of the balancing of childcare and work that we're all talking about as the a, a current challenge in this COVID-19 environment. Okay, Leo, very quick co final comment and then we're gonna take the last question. Well, on all these issues, Ron, I think one of the things we've called for is more of a board level focus. And for example, there are not, and, and to, on, as to all these issues, most companies don't have a workforce committee that deals with the full range of workforce issues. And if you couple the kind of standards and metrics that Roger and Ursula are talking about with a focus at the board level on diversity, equity, and inclusion, pay fairness, and attention as we've called for it to contracted workers, not just direct company workers, you're gonna have a focus for accountability and it will surface those best practices. And there'll also be a more public conversation at the higher levels of companies and in terms of the interaction with institutional investors. Okay, I wanna get one final question up just in the last couple of minutes here um, on government intervention. We've touched on this a little bit. Um, we have a question from um, John Alafajanis. I hope I got that right. As business leaders, what government intervention do you believe is needed to reform a system which has failed to equip both average workers and job seekers? So let's do, we've got really three minutes. Let's do a flash round. Um, Roger, Lynn, Ursula, Leo on, you know, what you'd like to see in 30 seconds from the Biden administration here. Roger, go. Well, um, TIA is primarily known for creating retirement security. And so there are a number of bipartisan acts that are in Congress now called the SECURE Act that drive further development towards uh, retirement security is one of the most important things. Uh, we've just surveyed 3,000 Americans and believe it or not, the top of the list in terms of financial insecurity was around retirement. And so I would say, you know, continued focus in that area, which by the way, has the advantage of having bipartisan support. Awesome. Lynn. Okay. I would say in general, the reason we need government action is to get back to the point that Ursula made before about why, why this framework is important, why we need a level playing field. It is a concept that Franklin Roosevelt understood very well in 1933 when he talked about having all companies reduce hours and increase pay together so that no one would be disadvantaged. So I think it is only government that can require these things. And to build back better has got to mean that we build capitalism back better and that, and that, that Joe Biden's words about rewarding workers, not just wealth, get incorporated into our climate policy. We cannot clean up the climate if we are leaving people in the dark if we are taking people off of oil rigs and giving them no jobs. We have to have yeah. the worker be the center of our trade policy, of our immigration policy, of our climate policy. So government has got to be a, fig, a, a big factor and that's why we did this work. Okay, Ursula. Three pillars in the, in the framework and I think that what I would like the Biden administration to do is read the framework, understand it, and develop policies to support these three pillars. One, fair gain sharing for workers. Two, more opportunities for workers. And three, expanding the workforce. Everything that he does and his leadership team does has to be focused on bringing forward the vast majority of people in this country that who are workers. So look at the framework. We have laid out, done a lot of work to lay it out. And I think reading it and following it would be 
my hope for the administration. Okay, that's that's an easy one and an important one. Leo, final word. Living wage. Um, some version of the of labor law reform to revitalize the right to join a union. Huge infrastructure package and requiring a workforce committee at all large companies, including private ones, and then um, metric requirements on EESG for large private company and institutional investors. That kind of thing would be transformational. It's bipartisan, it's supported by our framework, and it's the kind of thing people of good faith in business and labor could get together and really do, and it would benefit all American people, in, particularly in struggling communities. Okay, awesome. Uh, I could go on and on, but I know many of you have a hard stop. I wanted to thank the panelists. I want to thank the global audience. We've had folks calling in from, from Brazil, India, Australia, Nepal, Japan. Um, thank you all. Um, we are going to move on now uh, to the next panel. Phyllis, uh, sorry, Lydia de Phyllis of ProPublica is going to uh, take that forward. She's going to uh, have a panel of uh, experts representing business, labor, and civic society. And then I'm going to be back to talk with Senators Rob Portman and Mark Warner. So thank you all for joining and onward. When economic opportunity is limited to some of us, the promise of the American dream is at risk for all of us. For decades, our business practices and economic policies have favored capital over labor, wealth over work. As historical, racial, and other injustices have limited opportunities for others, we now realize the importance of an economy that works for all. Rebuilding our economy requires reforming how our system treats those who power it. It requires the government and the private sector to adopt meaningful policies and practices for worker well-being. The challenges are all around us, but so are the solutions. We need a new social compact with the American worker. That's why we've come together to develop the framework for inclusive capitalism, a new compact among business government, the American workers. Americans deserve a system that pays everyone a living wage, along with appropriate benefits. That hears worker voice and considers worker needs as essential to business success. And ensures the health and safety of our workforce. And creates more opportunities for Americans to advance with good jobs, training and lifelong learning, regardless of their race, gender, origin, or disability. But that's just the start. We are a diverse group of business and civic leaders, policy experts, economists, and scholars from different backgrounds, geographies, and political parties. We may not agree on everything, but we agree on a lot. Starting with 21 specific public policy and business practice recommendations that will create more inclusive outcomes for workers. These are common sense recommendations to rebuild an economy that won't hold our workers back. Our economy will be stronger when all working Americans have meaningful access to economic security and upward mobility. Visit coalitionforinclusivecapitalism.com and show your support for the framework and for the idea that every worker deserves his or her share of the prosperity that they help create. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lydia DePillis. I'm a reporter at ProPublica, uh, and I cover economic issues. I've had a long history as a labor reporter, though, as well. And so I'm very pleased to be moderating this panel on workers and how they can fit into the new framework for inclusive capitalism that these folks have pulled together. So we have an awesome panel today that I'm really excited to speak with, a really diverse set of folks from business, labor, and uh, and civil rights groups. So uh, starting off with Janet Margia, she's president and CEO of Unidas US, which is one of the nation's largest Latino advocacy groups. Uh, we have Barbara Humpton, who is president and CEO of Siemens USA, um, which is a German company that has a large US presence and they do a lot of infrastructure work. 
Uh, we have Ai-Jen Poo. She's the executive director of the National Domestic Workers Alliance, which has done amazing work to help uplift particularly nannies and cleaning workers, mostly in the home, so a very different type of workplace. Um, and then finally, we have Jim Boland, who's the former president of the International Union of Bricklayers and Allied Craft Workers. He was the president of that for about 10 years and recently stepped back into a board member role. So I just would love at, to start out with some reflections from each of you on what this year told you uh, or emphasized about what is broken for workers in this economy, and um, and you know uh, briefly just some quick observations on on what really matters in your sphere in terms of um, what needs to be fixed and how the pandemic illuminated that. Um, so I'll just start from clockwise in my little feed um, with. Let's start with Barbara. Yeah, and thanks you. So thank you so much. And this is really an incredible time for us because it's in times of disruption that we have the greatest opportunity to create the future we want, right? Everything is ungelled and it's making us ask what is different and what would we want if we could build to our own specifications? I think the main thing we've learned as humans is the power of people. We've just been through a decade where the internet of, of, of people, the internet of our uh, general commerce and our communications and our entertainment has gotten us connected in a way we've never seen before. And what we recognize at Siemens is the fact that the next 10 years are gonna be about integrating and connecting infrastructure. So we have a unique opportunity. And in the midst of the coronavirus, we at Siemens actually kept everyone working. We uh, we had to make some adjustments for market conditions, but didn't make any changes based on the effects of the coronavirus. We plowed through. And what we discovered is that if we can empower people, if we can give them access to digital tools, they're going to find all kinds of creative ways to meet their customers' needs. So as we look forward, what I am most focused on is the idea that the future economy is going to bring in a much more digital aspect. And we have a tremendous job to bring more people into that digital economy. Moving clockwise to Aijin. Thanks, Lydia. Um, I would say that going into this pandemic, um, we had an epidemic of low wage work in America and millions upon millions of workers working incredibly hard every single day and still not able to make ends meet or have access to a safety net or health care, essentially unable to take care of themselves and their own families. And the pandemic revealed to everyone in this country that all of these workers in the low wage service industries in particular um, it's not only made them visible, but revealed just how essential they are to our health, our safety, our survival, and that there's an urgent need to not only applaud them, but to protect them and to transform the quality of work and the way that we honor the dignity of work in our economy. And I'll say that, you know, disproportionate numbers of essential workers are women and people of color, five million undocumented essential workers. So there's a tremendous amount that we must do to address the root issues of how we came to have um, such an insecure uh, environment for so many working people in America. Just building on what Asian has laid out, really it's been how systemic inequalities have been highlighted, revealed. Uh, and we've seen the disproportionate impact that this pandemic has played on so many, but in particular, the Latino community. This pandemic has exposed and worsened issues of social and economic inequality for Latinos that we at Unidos US uh, have been working on for more than five decades. Uh, we saw that they were particularly hit hard uh, in that nearly two thirds of Latino workers have lost wages or work due to COVID compared to 48% of Americans overall. And it, I think it did fully reveal how Latino workers 
are helping to keep America going and fed in particular during this crisis from farm workers to meat processing plants to those stocking shelves and delivering food. Uh, yet the irony is that these very workers face the highest levels of food insecurity during this time. So there's a lot that we, I think, can uh, take away in this moment and address. And one of those things that we have to do is to make sure that we are including Latino workers in emergency economic relief, that we are keeping Latino workers in their homes and increasing wages and strengthening housing protections. And ultimately, as Asian has referenced as well, that we're stabilizing and protecting immigrant frontline workers in this crisis. And we simply have not done uh, a, a good enough job uh, to meet uh, the needs of these essential workers who have met the moment when it comes to uh, keeping America uh, going uh, during this um, once in a century crisis. I think COVID-19 is a tragedy uh, for working people, for poor people, and for the elderly. And we won't know till we get past it a little bit uh, just how severe it's been. But uh, I'm glad that the labor movement and uh, the administration put it at the top of the list to get the uh, pandemic under control and to move forward. Uh, I agree with uh, Barbara that this accelerates all kinds of change. In our industry that I was in, we were dealing a lot with uh, the transition to building informational modeling, robotics, uh, new, fresher ways of doing things. And of course, uh, this is opportunity as well as challenge. And uh, uh, we're all in it together. I come from a background where uh, collective bargaining agreements were the keystone of how we worked, both labor and management. I came from a tradition that's still in place where they worked everything out. I read the in document on inclusive capitalism. I like it, I think. Uh, but it's important to have government, both municipal, state, and federal, be good stewards of encouraging labor and management to come together and to look out for workers in general, you know, the the underprivileged and uh, immigrant workers like myself uh, who came here uh, so as we can get better outcomes from everybody going forward. So uh, I think I'll leave it at that for the moment. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all. So, um, you know, Jim mentioned and so did Barbara, the role of technology and um, you know, often technology has been seen as a force that tends to make workers irrelevant or eliminate their jobs. Um, and sometimes that happens. And sometimes though it has the power to make their jobs easier and less hard on bodies and, um, and allow people to access work. Um, I'd love to hear if anyone wants to jump in on um, what are the types of technologies that empower and assist and lift up workers? And what are the types that tend to degrade their quality of work and make it more difficult for them to provide for their families? I mean, uh, I'll, just, I'll, I'll call on you, Ajin, because I know that NDWA has done some really cool work and thinking around uh, with, with, uh, with NDWA labs around what kinds of things can be helpful and, and what are not that useful. Well, I think it's all about what is the goal. Um, technology is a tool. And um, when the incentives are towards designing for equity, opportunity, quality of life and quality of work, then it can work. And within our movement, we've created, um, we've leveraged technology to increase access to benefits for domestic workers who previously couldn't access benefits um, called Alia, a new portable benefits platform. Um, so you can, of course, utilize technology to improve the quality of work and improve access to a safety net. Um, but too often, the conversation about technology is really directed towards efficiency and convenience for consumers, and the workers are completely left out of the equation. And I, live, I work in a workforce that actually can't be automated 
or outsourced for that matter. Um, care work is by definition in person, human centered, relational and emotional work. And, um, and I do believe that there is a role that technology can play to make some of the most challenging aspects of the work a little bit easier and, um, and enhance actually the quality of work and the quality of services that workers are providing. Uh, but it's all about what the innovation is incentivized towards. And I think not enough innovation is incentivized in that direction. Well, I'll just add another dimension to that, that Asian uh, mm -hmm. talked about, but you know, what we've seen out of this particular <laughs> crisis is that for us in the Latino community, only 16% of our community had the ability to do their work from home. What we have to acknowledge mm -hmm. when folks talk about technology and maybe the future of work is that we still have a, a digital divide. We have access to broadband issues that still need to be addressed. And we're hoping that perhaps a focus on infrastructure will allow us to better highlight those, uh, again, systemic inequalities. But you know, we know how to train and upskill and we can bring a, a innovation and technology lens to all of that. But some of this is gonna require a commitment uh, by leaders in our country to address this from an infrastructure standpoint as well. I want to take one of the things that Ijen mentioned about technology and platforms and making life easy for consumers, because one of the things this framework addresses is the issue of classification of workers, which has been one of the like thorniest issues in labor policy over the last decade. And I don't see a lot of agreement there's often you know various skirmishes play out around the country from proposition 22 in california to the independent contractor rules that the trump administration published and so the framework sort of suggests that maybe there are different guide rails that are needed because of the changing workplace and different models of labor um, but we shouldn't offload the risk entirely to, to workers as we sometimes see and, uh, and allow it to depress wages. So I'd just be curious to know, um, do you all think that this classification issue is a matter of we need new laws to create new classifications or do we simply need to better enforce the laws on the books to make sure that tech platforms aren't basically using labor arbitrage to deprive people of benefit. And maybe Jim, I just, you know, with the bricklayers, you guys have a sort of a unique model around this. Um, what's your take? My experience of this is that there's quite a bit of it in construction industry. And uh, the employers that I've worked with over my career have no problem giving anybody an opportunity. One of their main complaints to me and to us was, that they had a hard time competing with contractors who misclassified immigrant workers or uh, workers who were at risk. And uh, they just couldn't compete with them because they treated them as um, uh, not as employers, but as contractors and uh, exploited them and just undercut the legitimate people who were tied to collective bargaining rates in various markets. So it's a huge problem and uh, it's come up in federal elections. We want uh, uh, the administration to bring focus to this, and I hope they can. It lifts the workers up if we do and start treating them as employees. And it also creates a fairer playing field for the legitimate contractors who are in these businesses for the long run. So that's my initial impression. I would comment on uh, technology as well. I came into the construction industry because that's what my family were in and I need that's where I could get a job. It's very hard work. I say anything that makes it easier is welcome. We try new things. It takes a while to refine them on the jobs. Uh, but that's the process of uh, workers and employers working these things out between themselves and the suppliers of the technology. And of course, nothing ever works at first, but anything that makes a job easier and more efficient is probably better for all involved, not just the consumer. It certainly should be if people are talking to each other about the challenges that implementation presents. 
It, let me uh, jump in just from the perspective. I, we've talked about uh, government, the role of government regulation, and, and actually the, the plight of workers. And, and I want to say this is a unique moment in history from the perspective of business. Uh, we now have data. I'm on the board of the Chief Executives for Corporate Purpose and, and, and supporting you know, these efforts to help businesses understand that the long-term um, stakeholder view, this, it, this view of inclusive capitalism really does yield better long-term business results too. So I'm delighted to hear Jim um, articulating these thoughts that yes, of course, as things change, businesses and workers need to collaborate to find out what's the best arrangement to, to pr progress the business in order to provide opportunity for others. In, in the work that I do, uh, long-term relationships matter because we tend to work on very complex things in which people become more and more valuable over time. I recognize there are other uh, propositions where someone carries their skill with them to many employers over time and, and many configurations can work. I would just, I would like to be one voice that says, I don't believe that further government regulation is the answer, the be all end all. There is absolutely a role here for responsible businesses to stand up, be accountable, do what's right and demonstrate that as institutions, businesses are also uh, seeing the benefit of, of doing the right thing for people. Oh, I was just going to make a point about the classification issue, which is that um, there is a tremendous amount of worker class misclassification out there, and there should be enforcement of that. And regardless of the classification of work, there is too much poverty work, period. Um, there are terrible W-2 jobs. There are terrible independent contractor jobs. And fundamentally that needs to be addressed for the 21st century and it means that things like sick days this is also in the inclusive capitalism paper that things like paid sick days paid leave basic benefits should be available to everyone throughout the economy regardless of what your employment classification is and i think that larger point, I just want to make sure it doesn't get lost in the conversation mm -hmm. about classification. No, I think that's a good point. And also, it's just been interesting to see um, how in our stimulus programs, to some degree, they were a little bit more universal than our ongoing like unemployment insurance, right? It was available to more different types of workers, and maybe that is a path forward. Um, sorry, again, I didn't mean to. Well, no, again, just building on, on both uh, Barbara and Asian's comments, I mean, I just think, you know, uh, for us, look, we see Latino workers as filling, a, you know, already one in three entrants into the workforce, but by 2024, one in five workers in America will be uh, Hispanic or Latino. And I guess for us is, you know, because we're likely to fill jobs and in various sectors, uh, it is important that these jobs offer good pay, benefits, and other supports like what Asia was mentioning, you know, family sustaining wages by increasing minimum wage, mandating paid sick wages or sick leave and family paid and medical leave, you know, safety protocols uh, that are in dual language and, um, you know, just child care support uh, for a lot of the women so that we can have opportunities for, uh, you know, uh, to fill the jobs that are gonna be needed, whether it's technology or elsewise, but those broader supports are gonna be necessary. And, uh, you know, that can be part of a public private sector approach, but those supports need to be there. I would like to add, um, you know, we're in the era of COVID still and uh, the health of the workforce and uh, controlling the diseases first and foremost. But speaking about the role of government, you know, a lot of construction workers are working, they're wearing masks, they're distancing, uh, maintaining protocols. But just an example or a snippet about government's role, I had some reason to look at the city of Los Angeles <laughs> website and most of our workers in cities. Uh, there's a directive there if your construction site does not conform to COVID protocols, 
we will shut you down. And I, I think it's useful for government to, uh, you know, to be able to raise the gavel in the background of some of this stuff uh, to prevent people to, uh, from uh, getting wild with things. Um, so, you know, it can easily happen that people get carried away. We don't want a heavy-handed government, but a slight, like, nice to know it's there on matters of health and safety that are so important in an industry like construction and not to lessen anybody else's industry, but health and safety are first and foremost when somebody goes to work every day, in my experience, and I'm sure it's uh, the case for most other people too. One innovative thing that's happened around health and safety in the pandemic that is about the role of government, but also about the private sector and workers is that these four, these uh, uh, health and safety boards have formed at the local and county level where local government is bringing together worker representatives and employers to actually talk together about what it looks like to reopen the economy safely for everyone involved. And workers actually have a seat at the table and a voice in defining what that looks like. And I just think that that's essential for our economic recovery process as a whole. And there's a tremendous amount that we can learn from these processes. So there's really helpful models in this moment of the pandemic. Yeah, no, I'm glad you brought that up because I think a really important piece of this is, is worker power and leverage and, um, and how to address that and support it. And, you know, I, 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 I'd like to know what you guys think about is the best way to do that simply making it easier to join unions, which has been really tough uh, increasingly over the last few decades? Um, or is it to try to support other forms of worker leverage, whether that's saying, a, you know, European style, certain percentage of your board must be composed of workers or some other model? Like, um, what do you, what would be the one or two most important ways to increase worker leverage, which would take, honestly take care of a lot of these issues if workers can say what they need and, and make it happen. I think all of the above, just to kick it mm -hmm. off, I think we need to strengthen bargaining rights and the ability for workers to join unions. I also think we need to set up standards boards and other creative models to give workers a seat at the table I think for an industry like ours, where there's no collective and there's no one to bargain with, having sectoral models where government plays a role in bringing together employers and workers to establish standards together is a really important model. So I think all of these models are necessary and, and, and urgent, actually, as we think about what it looks like to recover from COVID-19. Building on those comments in the all of the above, um, with what's really cool as you know, we've been talking about things are changing rapidly, and the way we can be most agile is to actually include employees in the shaping of the work to be done. In the case of Siemens, that starts with literally ownership culture, having all employees be able to own shares in the company and they benefit as the, as the company thrives. And then we're using so many avenues to include employee voices in setting the direction of the company. I'm seeing that same spirit of engagement being adopted by organizations from small startups to the largest of large corporations. And, and it's exciting to see. And just engaging both employers and employees around practices that have proven successful when it comes to training methods is also, you know, when you lead by outcomes that show that you've been thoughtful about uh, training uh, your employees, giving them the opportunities for upward mobility, that speaks volumes. And in our experience, community industry partnerships have been very successful. They help to create that pipeline of talent that involve both employers and employees and training curriculums designed to ensure their commitment to that employment. And uh, community-based organizations and community colleges uh, also can be key players as you're looking at all of the ecosystem there for how to be successful in providing those supports and earning credits for completing training programs. You know, taking a holistic approach to this is, I think, 
uh, reflects that openness and inclusion that we need to see more of. And for us in the Latino community and immigrant community workers, you really need to have culturally and linguistically relevant uh, training programs. But if you can start by practice having, uh, you know, ongoing engagement that includes employers and employees so that they're seeing themselves in the actual work and ha have upward mobility. I just think that's a very powerful message. I'd be remiss if I didn't say, I believe collective bargaining is the gold standard for labor management mm -hmm. relations, the best possible uh, scenario for any worker to work under. Uh, why do I say that? Well, the agreements are negotiated by representatives of labor and management on both sides. There's a set of rules that are enforced by labor and management under uh, grievance systems. And uh, everything we have as uh, union members working under collective bargaining agreements flows from that agreement. We finance our training programs. The union I belong to has over 100 training centers across the country, which we finance through collective bargaining. We have our health benefits. We have our uh, pensions. And we're both sides are intimately involved in preserving those benefits. So if you're fortunate enough, and if they pave the way for more people to use this model, I think it's a great leap forward and it, it starts to address things like uh, uh, immigrant rights and uh, economic equality for uh, more uh, marginalized workers, uh, if we want to stretch here in this. But it's, it's very important. And I think, a lot of, I think it's a, almost a well-kept secret from a lot of people. Uh, people should take a much closer look at it, not to... Uh, understate the good work that my friends on the panel do, which is very important too. Okay, we have to wrap up, but I do want to do a last quick lightning round, just yes or no. Um, do you think that a $15 minimum wage gets in, gets passed in the U.S. in 2021? Barbara, yes or no? Yes. Yes? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Of course. You see, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Great. Um, thank you all very much. We have to leave it there, but uh, I appreciate it. It's a great conversation, and um, we'll see what happens. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back to all our viewers and welcome to this fireside chat with Senator Rob Portman and Senator Mark Warner. I'm Rana Faruhar, Associate Editor of the Financial Times and Global Economic Analyst for CNN. And I'm really, really delighted to be here um, helping to facilitate and moderate the second conversation that the senators have done um, as part of uh, this discussion on inclusive capitalism. You all did this first fireside conversation uh, in 2018 together, and you both have a history of working across the aisle with each other, with others, and it is such an important moment for that right now. Um, it's hard really uh, to imagine a more important historical moment um, for inclusive capitalism, for developing a new agenda, for, for helping to kind of create a new paradigm for growth that can also underpin liberal democracy and, and the future of our country. I know both of you are very devoted to that. So let me start right off. Uh, we've got about 20 minutes for discussion. Let me ask you, what, where, where is the low hanging fruit? I hesitate, I know there is no low hanging fruit these days, but but where where is the opportunity for bipartisan cooperation around these goals, around the framework for inclusive capitalism that's being put forward in this program? Um, Senator Portman, maybe you can kind of start and, and Senator Warren, you can jump in. Well, first of all, thank you, Rana. And I appreciate being on with Mark again. He's literally at his fireside, so uh, great for a fireside <laughs> chat. Um, you know, last time we talked a lot about the economic issues and um, Honestly, at that time, the economy was very strong. We'd had uh, several months of unemployment going down and, and wages going up, and uh, it's very different now. I mean, we're, we find ourselves post-COVID in a situation where uh, part of the economy is doing well, but uh, much of the economy, not just here in this country, but around the world, 
is struggling. And since you are the global economic analyst for CNN, uh, you can talk more about what's happening in Western Europe, but also in developing countries. But there's um, unfortunately two things happening uh, that I think work against the notion of inclusive capitalism, as you said, underpinning our liberal democracies. One is uh, there's an increasing gap. So as of February of last year, meaning a year ago, uh, we had 19 straight months of wage growth. Uh, mostly uh, that growth was going to middle income workers. Uh, we also had the lowest poverty rate in the history of our country. Uh, that's mm -hmm. changed and the gap has widened. So uh, you think about this, people are teleworking who are white collar and they're doing great. Uh, there are some people who are not able to do that because they may work in a restaurant that's been closed or they may be, um, you know, construction workers who, who don't have work. So there is a, a gap that's, that's grown and the data is still coming out on that. But I think that is counter to everything that we were kind of focused on before, which is how to make capitalism inclusive and how to close some of the wage gap and, and how to help people feel that it is a truly opportunity economy. Uh, and then second, I, I would say that in the COVID period, um, you know, there's just uh, a lot of partisanship that has uh, grown up around some of the answers to some of our, our questions. And uh, we can talk about that later, but right now we're in the middle of an impeachment trial in the United States Senate. And then we're about to go into a period where uh, apparently uh, Democrats are gonna promote an idea where you don't have to get Republican buy-in called reconciliation to move legislation forward. Both of those cause more partisanship. And uh, so that's my, that's my short-term view right now is that we need to figure out a way to I'll take a deep breath and go back to what President Biden talked about in his inaugural address. Uh, but I'd love to hear from Mark on it. And then in terms of the positive side, I think there are a number of things we can and should do uh, to be able to allow people to feel more of a stake uh, in the future of our economy and, and, and their family's future. Well, you know, you, well, you mentioned partisanship, and I know I know um, you've decided that you're not going to run again because of gridlock and that that has been a major concern. Senator Warner, um, do you think COVID has made that worse? And and again, you know, it's it's both a challenge and an opportunity. How can we make sure that we don't miss the opportunity? Well, Anna, I actually um, am a, a bit more optimistic, although I hate uh, that Rob is a great friend and, and great colleague um, is not going around again, uh, but he's he's assured us that he's gonna be in the fight for these next couple of years. Um, let me also thank all of you for doing this and you know, particularly shout out to our dear friend, Lynn Rothschild, who kind of has been one of the moving forces behind the whole uh, inclusive capitalism movement for a number of years. Uh, where I might differ from Rob a little bit is, I think we've, <clears throat> in some areas, COVID has split difference. I think a lot of that partisan divide was driven by Donald Trump more than COVID, because if we look at actually how the country has responded to COVID, uh, at least from mm -hmm. a financial investment side, we you know we put together um, the first CARES bill and got virtually unanimous support, two point two trillion dollars, the largest investment in single investment in American history. We followed that up with additional small business support a couple months later. And then um, a group of us, uh, driven by folks like Rob and me in the Senate, got pretty frustrated with our political leadership uh, in both political parties. We knew that the economy was going, going down uh, during the fall. And rather than having the posturing back and forth, a group of us, 10 of us came together um, put together a $900 billion package that was signed finally uh, by Mr. Trump uh, late December, and that got 92 votes. So uh, I think our, our record of bipartisanship in terms of COVID relief, economic relief has been good. And I, I think that the key, and I know we'll get into this uh, you know, in, in the next couple of minutes, is you know, can we move away from some of the traditional discussions where everybody has got a pre-established position? And can we get at you know, what the new social contract looks like? Can we get, you know, portable benefits? Can we get at investment in human capital in perhaps a different way? Can we look at, you know, ESG and long-term capital investments where people may be coming with fresh ideas? And frankly, there's not uh, a, a partisan position on a lot of these issues. So uh, I'm hopeful that in this moment of crisis, we can not only do stimulus, but that we can also um, move on some of these bigger issues. 
Well, let's actually, that's a great jumping off point. Um, you know, you're touching on a number of issues. COVID um, has underscored the fact that the economy is going to come out in many ways in a different place, right? Even, even post-stimulus, um, whatever packages do and don't get through, we're going to have a very changed workforce, right? We're going to have a, a companies will, will survive, but they're going to be more digital. Uh, there's probably going to be some technological uh, job displacement. On the other hand, there are new opportunities to work from home. I mean, we're all doing this this session remotely and 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 pretty um, pretty well. So, what does that mean in terms of how we need to structure the economy to work for this new workforce and for the companies that are coming out? Um, Senator Portman, what 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 would you what if you would maybe name one change you you think is doable that you would like to see? along these lines in the next couple of years? Well, first of all, I agree with you on more people working from home and also more telehealth and more telelearning. And I don't think that's uh, uh, a negative. I think that is uh, one of the rare silver linings in an otherwise dark cloud of the coronavirus pandemic. And when I talk to doctors and for that matter, patients back home, including uh, people who are um, in uh, uh, mental health, uh, uh, practices or people who are um, recovering from uh, drug addiction, many of them are feeling like the telehealth option has been very, very successful and, and helpful for them. Um, one thing that <laughs> certainly we could find bipartisanship on right now, I would think would be expansion of broadband. In fact, for the discussion we're having right now, it seems like uh, all three of us could use a little more uh, broadband infrastructure because <laughs> we're breaking up a little bit. Uh, Good point. But truly, you know, if you look nationally, uh, roughly 100 percent of people who live in the big urban areas have access, uh, in theory, to broadband. It's, a, it's relatively fast. Uh, they don't have the funds necessarily to access it. So that's part of it. But then in the rural areas, there's not even the opportunity. Um, about 25 percent of the people in Ohio have no access to broadband at all, even slow broadband. So I think that's one where you could see a substantial investment that would pay off uh, quite well and is consistent with the post-COVID economy, because I, I agree with you there, you know, we, we've learned some things and in a way it could be a more, a more efficient economy. Although I think some of these uh, office buildings, uh, you know, are, are gonna have a tough time finding tenants. That's gonna hurt the economy, I suppose, but it will help to have the broadband to be able to truly uh, be able to conduct business, get your healthcare and learn online. And I think that's, that's a great opportunity. And Mark uh, named some others that I totally agree with that I think could be pretty nonpartisan. Mm. Um, Senator Warner, I want to give you a chance to talk about portable benefits because that's you've been passionate about that for years. Yeah. Well, it's um, well. First of all, let me echo what Rob just said about about broadband. This is you know, just as you know, lots of people make the analogy to rural electrification or rural telephony back in the '30s. I think it's absolutely essential. Uh, you know, I think there needs to be a federal government investment. There needs to be a private sector investment. I think we need to break some of the established status quo where oftentimes the incumbent internet service providers don't provide expanded service. And um, But this is an area where there's not a Democrat or Republican solution. So I think great opportunity there. Um, but I do think people, because they're going to work in different environments, more remotely, as Rob has indicated, I think the idea that everybody's going to work in a 40-hour W-2 traditional 20-year uh, work environment it's just not going to be the case. People are going to continue to have different revenue streams. They're going to have different gigs. Um, you know, they may drive an Uber and run out Airbnb and be an IT consultant and start a business. And the challenge with that is, you know, the 20th century social contract that worked pretty well for about 60 years just isn't working for those folks. And we've seen that because so much of our, our workforce, when the stuff did hit the fan, had nothing to fall back on. So the federal government was able to come through, but there was really no other, um, there was no nothing for vast majority of Americans to fall back on. So I strongly encourage the idea that with work ought to come, every hour of work ought to come some portion of benefits. Those benefits ought to be portable. Um, they, we got to experiment on different groups to manage those, whether it's government or private sector or worker organizations or uh, there's actually some interesting models in the upper Midwest on on church groups uh, and, and, uh, measuring and, 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 and grappling with these benefits. But we need that kind of experimentation. And again, I, I can make this a conservative argument or a 
liberal argument. And I think there, it, it makes so much sense to me, but there's been so many forces of the status quo that have fought it. You're right, and I've been, I've been an advocate for this for a long time, but we candidly have not made much progress over the last four or five years on this subject. What what makes you think or not that this could be a moment to push forward with that? Um, I'm particularly interested in the, on the benefit question because this is really something I, I've long wondered why American business wasn't pushing more for, given that um, health care and benefits are, you know, um, such a competitive disadvantage in some ways that the private sector has to carry that load in ways that overseas competitors don't. There seems to be a growing consensus on both sides that you know we really are going to have a, a fully changed economy. I mean, what is the lever that can be pushed? What would the legislative package look like that could could push through some of these ideas? Well, let me start with that. I, I think, ironically, um, some of traditional old school labor has been huh. fighting the portability of benefits because they want everybody to fit into a traditional. 20th century worker classification category. And I get that, um, but I don't think that's going to come to pass. I don't think if we look at the um, uh, the ballot initiative in, in California, AB5, where you know Joe Biden wins by millions and millions of votes in California, 58% of the people did want, not want to put all work into a classic uh, worker classification area. And flip side was originally the gig companies didn't want to provide benefits. Now I think they do. So I think we need this kind of experimentation. So I hope we will have this moment. And when we talk about you know, stimulus packages, we don't just think about traditional you know, writing checks to people, but um, making some structural change. And let me quickly add, uh, I also hope that we rethink the investment in human capital. I, you know, you've heard mm. me talk about this before, that you know, a company goes out and invests in a robot. Uh, they get an R&D tax credit for the robot. The robot's an asset on their balance sheet. The company goes out and invests in two workers to be more efficient than the robot. You don't get any of the same tax preferences, and that's viewed as an expense. There's no place to capitalize that or have that appear on your balance sheet. You talk about a way to partner with business in a major way. Let's change the tax, accounting, and reporting uh, requirements around investment in human beings. That would also, you know, I think, align workers and businesses in a, in a frankly, progressive but also business-friendly way. Well, that's Ronnie, interesting. You talked that's about the... Uh, you talked about a vehicle yeah. that could be used for, for some of these ideas. Uh, during the negotiation over these packages uh, responding to COVID-19, we did have a bipartisan group. Mark was very much a part of it. And one of the things that we, we did uh, back in the original CARES bill was we expanded unemployment insurance to include gig economy workers, self-employed. And I had a town hall meeting last night where a woman called in who said that, you know, she is self-employed. She's a massage therapist. Her business is, is not doing well. Uh, but she is very grateful for the fact that we changed the unemployment system to include her. And uh, most states, of course, don't do that. So it was a federal benefit, a federally funded benefit. But I think that's a potential vehicle is to look at our COVID-19 package that we're now talking about working on to extend that unemployment insurance provision and to say, you know, how do you provide incentives for states to provide uh, UI benefits for a growing class of workers. We think it's about 16% of the workforce in Ohio actually would be would, would qualify under huh. this self-employed gig economy workers um, and so on. Uh, some of them drive Ubers, but you know some of them provide services every, every day to uh, to uh, our community. The other vehicle in terms of the issue of benefits that is coming up is that we have a bipartisan approach called the Secure Act Two. Really, it's uh, and Mark's involved with it. Uh, Senator Cardin from Maryland. Um, is very involved. And, and the idea is to get a bipartisan, bicameral, private retirement security bill done. And there are two aspects of it that are, that are quite different than what we've done in the past. One is part-time workers would be able to get benefits. And so the idea of making your benefits portable uh, exists, obviously, with an IRA, even with a 401k. Uh, you know, you can consolidate your, your 401k. But many part-time workers, uh, in fact, roughly... Uh, 80% of part-time workers do not have private retirement savings. And so we changed the, the law to say that you can actually qualify for retirement savings under a 401k with fewer hours of work to, uh, to bring in part-time workers. It's one reason the AARP, frankly, is supporting our efforts. They're very big on the part-time worker. A lot of seniors are working part-time uh, and are looking mm -hmm. to try to you know, bolster their retirement accounts. So that's actually a vehicle that's moving now. 
And then we also expand uh, significantly what's called the savers credit for low income individuals. Um, so it's, it's a move toward benefits that will be more broadly available in the areas where you have a, a problem. The larger businesses that are listening to this call today, they all provide 401ks and most provide a pretty healthy match. Uh, the issue is more with regard to small businesses and with regard to part-time workers um, and, uh, and again, low-income Americans. And so this is, this is a vehicle that's moving, I think, in the next couple of months. I spoke to someone in the Ways and Means Committee of Democrat about it today, and it seems like that's an area for... Okay. Let me, um, uh, just before we run out of time, I want to make sure to hit the issue of skills, education, um, how we can revamp worker training. This is something that both of you have thought so much about. Um, uh, Senator Portman, you know, being involved in the Senate Career and Technical Education Caucus, um, Senator Warner with the Future of Work initiatives. Um, let's start, Senator Warner, with you. Um, you know, this debate is often very binary. People talk about we need more STEM or we need more creative thinking, and, and it, it tends to get very siloed. Do you have thoughts on? how we should rethink education for the 21st century and what legis legislatively um, could really get done, um, you know, in the next three or four years around that? Well, I think, as Rob mentioned in his first answer, that there's going to be a lot more telelearning through tools if we've got broadband uh, deployed. I think one of the things that's frustrated me since I was a governor is that we really don't have very good data on what workforce training programs work and I start with a bias that many of the government ones don't have as good outcomes as the private sector ones, why I would change and incent businesses to do more of this. Um, mm. But I think we have to look beyond that because a business would make those investments if somebody was going to work for the firm for 30 years, if somebody's going to only be a part-time worker or, or a gig worker or might be moving to another position. That's why we've got, I think, change the tax and accounting uh, so there's even more incentive for the business to invest. I also think there's some interesting things, as, as you know, are happening around Europe or where in France and in and, um, and the UK where companies can either invest in, in workforce training or they can pay into a government fund that would provide that workforce training, hopefully with better metrics. Um, because we have seen, unfortunately, because of the, the, the fact that the workforce is moving around so much, there's been about a 22 percent decrease in business investment in training. And we've got to yeah. we've got to change that. And you know, and we what we do in our country, as we know, is we do pretty well K through 12 in terms of investing. You know, for people who go to college, we do all right in terms of 18 through 22 or 25 with graduate school. But as a society, the amount of money we invest once you're into the workforce, or yeah, uh, is is really pretty pitiful. And and in in a world where the economy is going to change, and frankly, COVID accelerated the move to a digital economy. I would argue by a decade. Uh, we're going to have to really rethink this. But again, this is an area where I don't think there's a Democrat or Republican proposal. I think there's one uh, that we can learn from around the world. And I think there's um, a chance to actually engage the business community in a major way. Well, that's that's absolutely true. Senator Portman, there's so much experimentation around education actually going on in Ohio. I know there's a lot of models um, locally. Is there something that's really popping for you? Do you think we need to move away from pushing four years education or four years of of college for everyone? Do we need to move to a more kind of Germanic vocational model? What What's working? Well, it's a, it's a great question. There's some really exciting career and technical schools in Ohio, and it's not your old uh, vocational education. It's not even your old CTE. Uh, it's, it's really exciting. A lot of high tech stuff, a lot of uh, uh, classes for, you know, eight to ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th graders. Um, and I think it should go back as far as possible that pr provide them technical training, not just for um, welding and, um, you know, hospital tech work and, and, and IT and other things that are very important, but specifically, you know, training people up to, um, you know, be able to work with artificial intelligence uh, to deal with this transition we're making in terms of technology and manufacturing, very high tech stuff and, and, and very, uh, I think, helpful to our economy because we do have a lack of people who are properly trained for the high skilled jobs that are out there. Um, as you know, I have a proposal with Mark's colleague from Virginia that Mark's been helpful on, which is to say from the federal government perspective of all the money we're spending on, on the four year universities and colleges, as you talk about, 
why not take some of that, uh, not away from those colleges and universities, but adding to it and provide it to people who choose not to go that route, but instead want to get an industry recognized credential. Right now, you can't do that through what's called the Pell Grants, which is our primary means to help low income students. And so our proposal is very simple. It says allow Pell Grants also to be used for shorter term training programs that qualify, that have a, you know, again, an industry recognized credential at the end of the process. Those young people will be greatly advantaged because they'll have a job waiting for them. You know, uh, there's a great need for those kinds of skills. And my sense is it would be very successful. Right now, unfortunately, most young people who take a Pell and go to college or university don't end up getting a degree. And a lot yeah. of it's because of other financial constraints. Um, if you have a 10 week training program ahead of you to, again, learn, learn how to be, uh, let's say, uh, an underwater welder, which is one of the, you know, very highly paid jobs right now um, in the in the energy industry, you're going to get through that 10 weeks and, and you're going to get that job and, and, um, and you'll be getting paid, uh, you know, significant wages at a young age and benefits and not have any student debt. And I think that is helpful to the economy, helpful to those workers, um, and is part of the model that we ought to be looking at from the federal government perspective. I started with Senator Portman. Senator Warner, I'm going to let you have the last word. What is one really great blue sky idea that we should throw into this conversation that we haven't talked about yet? Well, I hope it's not purely blue sky, but I think we've seen uh, responsible leaders in corporate America become much more committed to being socially responsible, whether driven by their workforce, driven by public pressure, by their customers. So I think working with the SEC and the SEC, even under President Trump moved on this about human capital reporting, but I think we could do human capital reporting as a material item. I think we could do uh, reporting around investment in human capital. Uh, we could do reporting around resilience and climate. And um, you know, if we make those reportable items. I think businesses will respond, and uh, I think it will be good for business. I think it'll be good for those brands, and it'll be good for um, um, you know business working with elected officials to kind of set this agenda. So we've got a capitalism that really where we started ends up being more inclusive. I'm a big time capitalist, but we got to make sure it works for enough people. Well, I think that that's a good place to end an optimistic note. Um, I want to thank Senator Portman, Senator Warner. It's been a great discussion. Um, you all have been leaders in not only bipartisanship, but thinking about inclusive capitalism for many years now. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, I hope that we will have this conversation again and have lots more to report um, and some of the framework that has been enacted to talk about next time. So thanks for being here and thanks to the audience for listening. Thanks, Rana. Thanks, Mark. Thanks. Wow, thank you so much. And that brings us to the end of the public launch for our framework for inclusive capitalism, a new compact among business, government, and the American workers. Thank you to everyone who has joined us today. And a huge thank you to all of the commissioners who over the past 18 months have worked so hard on the framework. What we're talking about is simply addressing workers' needs with a laser on the level of inequality that has persisted since the 80s in this country. And a cry for living wages and fair worker voice in the boardroom and among management. In the same way that we want Republicans and Democrats to come together for the best interest of the common good, we need management and labor to come together to think of these ideas and many others about how to create more inclusive prosperity. Together, management and labor, Republicans and Democrats can truly forge a new compact among government, business, and American workers. If you would like to read the framework in full, please visit our website, coalitionforinclusivecapitalism.com and show your support or ask us your questions. Over the next three months, we will be having forums throughout the country discussing the framework. And we invite you to join us in any or all of them. But for now, thank you for your time today. 
and please stay safe and well.